Good morning. Today is June the 19th, 2023. We welcome you to our NAWA series of workshops. And um, today we are honored to have Pat Salisco conduct one of her um, workshops titled How to Meaningfully Talk About and Critique Your Art and Learn an Easy Tool to Create a Meaningfully Artist Statement. We have two featured artists, Carlene McConnell and Elizabeth Williams, and uh, we will all participate in critiquing their work. I want to introduce to you uh, Pat as um, formerly a lawyer, and that wasn't by choice, that was encouraged by her family because they wanted her to call a steady income, I believe, and she was... Uh, a, a very good lawyer and when she retired then she pursued her passion and she's doing it a vengeance getting all these residencies abroad and in the united states and now it's a home-based residency i uh, understand and if you go to her web you can learn about her her beautiful work with collages mixed media and her search for meaning. And uh, she says that she started when she was a little girl with her Ukrainian background painting eggs, that it was traditional for ladies and women to paint eggs. So that sparked her interest in art. Uh, after attending several workshops with literature and other um, in disciplines, she has realized that she can develop more of her art when she listens to this literature she can apply it to her art so um we are delighted to have you pat today and wow, thank you, um, and also uh we had the um cover when before we started the meeting that she's giving her proceeds of her donation of, of her exhibit, her current exhibit for the Naples Botanical Society, and she'll tell us more about it. And um, so they are trying to protect the shores by uh, planting more, especially in the ocean. I believe they're doing the same for this is the Naples Botanical Garden. So we're trying to do this uh, throughout the world, but Pat is donating all of her proceeds, I believe to this uh, institution. And she's always looking to help others. Uh, when I know she was also raising funds to send uh, money there. So it's very nice to have somebody not only caring about mm -hmm. herself, but caring about humanity. So with you, Pat. Thank you. Let's get started. That's very kind. This show um, is on until January 21st. It has opened already. Um, there's gallery space in the, I think they pronounce it the Fogue cafe so there are 20 small collages which i refer to as my visual diary of hurricane ian and when i completed the series um i live in southwest florida i live just north of uh, naples and south of fort myers i live near sanibel um fort myers beach i'm very close but when i saw the devastation i i was traumatized and i started this diary, I created these 20 small collages. And just around the time I was wrapping it up, and I felt I was saying everything I had to say with them, I learned about this project that the Naples Botanical Garden had started. And they're trying to restore the coastline through plantings and cleanup. So that we need the mangroves and we need the dunes. It's the only thing that saves us from rising uh, tides at this point until we do something more about how we're building our homes on the shoreline. So this is my way of giving back to that project. I think it's critical. Um, so if you have any questions, just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll let you know about it. Um, and if you if you care to go down and see it, I'll meet you there. I'd love to meet, see you and uh, talk to you more about it. I'm ready to begin whenever you guys are. Okay. Yeah, Muffy, my, my information is it's pronounced Fogue. That's me. Had you want to explain a little bit about today's workshop, please, about friends? Okay, look, I, I have to give um, full credit to what 
I'm going to be sharing with you to Fran Gardner. I study with uh, Fran Gardner, who's a dear friend of mine. Um, Fran in another life was a professor at the University of South Carolina, um, Lancaster. Um, she's very, very bright, very articulate, loves literature. Um, and Fran introduced us in one of her classes to this wonderful technique and method of critiquing work that wasn't the usual. It wasn't a technical critique. It was a more constructive way to talk about your work. And we need those skills as artists. If we have a show, if we participate in a group show and somebody approaches us and they want to learn more about the work, we need to be able to explain um, what our work is, who we are, what motivates us, um, without necessarily describing technical things that, that are common to describing your process. And what I did with the tools that she gave me, which is what we're going to work with today, this method of critiquing the work, I, I took that and I used it to write an artist statement. Um, and for me, writing is very, very painful, believe it or not. I was a litigator in another life. I did not like writing briefs. I did not like arguing appeals. I like to be on my feet trying cases. I, the act of putting pen to paper is really hard for me. So I found using her method of critiquing work as a useful way to learn how to write an artist statement, which is very difficult for anybody to do. I mean, you, here you are explaining why you create art and what motivates you to make it and talking about a body of your work. But I'll explain during this session how you, you translate one into the other. Basically, what we're going to do is look at three pieces of art. I have asked the artists involved, Carlene McConnell and Elizabeth Williams, um, to share with us work that they felt was they wanted us to look at, critique in this constructive way. Um, and from that, we can craft an artist statement. Now, what we're going to do is basically provide 15 to 20 meaningful short words or phrases about the work we're looking at. And the first artist we're looking at now is Carlene McConnell. We're going to stay away from language that is pretty nondescript, like dreamy stuff. Um, we're going to try to focus on concrete terms that people can understand, we can sink our teeth into. Um, so those are the types of words and, and or short phrases we're going to use. And in the end, we're going to take those and I'll show you how we create an artist statement. I may not be able to give you the whole thing here, but I can certainly write it up afterwards and send it to all the participants here in an email so you get to see what I'm talking about. I can share it with Denise, she'll know who everybody is here. Um, and we can pass it along that way. So does anybody have any questions before we begin? I don't nope. see any hands. <laughs> okay, we've got 18 people here, that's a lot. Okay, and um, Fran is here too. So Fran, thank you for giving me the skills to do this and introducing me to newer and better ways to look at my work. You are so welcome, Pat, and everybody else. Okay. Fran recently, by the way, in a workshop, talked about not only critiquing your work and talking about your work to, to, to others, but also a statement. And I latched on to one thing that she said that was very meaningful to me. Your artist statement or what you tell people about your work should serve as a roadmap on how you want people to approach your work when they see it. And that has stuck with me. And for me, that's very meaningful. I think that's exactly what an artist statement should do. It's what we should do when we participate in an artist talk and we're asked to speak about our art. So um, try to keep that in mind. Okie doke, this is Carlene's first painting. We don't know titles. Um, can you give us a general idea of the size, Carlene? Um, this one is uh, 30 by 40, I believe. Okay. So this is the first one. 
everybody have a, a good look at this one for starters? Mm -hmm. Okay, how about let's do another one. Go move on to the second one, Denise. Thank you. Oh, perfect. All right. This one's 48 by 48. Thank you. Okay, ready for the next one? And there was one more, I think. Yeah, there's a third one. It's a small one. I will find it. It is here. Pat, even with the two that we saw, we can do the critique, correct? We can. Yeah, we can yeah. start. It was, I saw it there in the little uh, icons, but then it didn't. Yeah. Oh, there it is. There we go. This one's about 20 by 20. Yeah, this is a small file, so that's why it looks kind of yeah, blurry. Okay. Okay. All right, anybody want to start with a short phrase or a word that's concrete? If you want, I'll start it. I can start. Abstract right. expressionist. What was How it? about layered? Excuse me? Oh. Layered. Layered, layered yeah. is good. Bold. Bold. I see fantastical landscapes. I see movement. I like the composition, the division of the canvas into parts is very unusual and beautiful. Grid-like structures, would you say, Helene? I don't think they're grid-like. I, I like the way the canvas is broken up into many pieces and all of them just beautifully put together. There's a gritty texture of a dryness to it. I was going to say brushy. Mm -hmm. Brushy surfaces? Yeah. Textured dry surfaces too. To me, those surfaces create different moods. Like in the one we're looking at now, I almost feel like I'm looking at a painting of four seasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the first one, the one with that big sphere in the sky, I almost feel like I'm on a, I'm on Mars. I'm on a different planet. Mm. Well, I like the, the the way the color is used, and the way the brush strokes are are used. They're very free and open and loose. Beautiful. I think a black hole. A black hole. Yeah. Okay. I think the background color on the first one comes through throughout. Mm -hmm. that, the middle piece reminds me of taking a road trip. Like, you you know, a road trip you're looking forward to taking with your family and it's a beautiful sunny day and you're it's optimistic. I see the brand. I see an expansive vision, especially in the first one. In the second one. There's a looseness to them too. It, there's not a lot of tight knit detail. It's very loose and open. I see some pencil detail on at least the first two. Yeah, there's, it's a nice combination of line making. You've got thinner lines and you've got these thicker lines and they create great shapes. But by the way, when we get to the part where we're talking about statements, like an artist statement, 
what I seem to have learned, not just from Fran, but from others, is that there's a distinction between an artist statement and a process statement. So when we start talking about pencil lines, you know, the width of a brush, we're beginning to really get into process. And that that's really, to me, that's something different. So when we sit down and we do a statement, an artist statement, unless those things are really critical to understanding the work, I stay away from them hmm. when I create a statement. I look at this middle one and it looks like a forest to me. You, you know, it's a roadway going past a forest and I see clouds in the distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, definitely these are all landscapes of some kind. Mm -hmm. They're very mysterious too. Mm -hmm. But That's the color the, is yeah. so unusual. Very, it reminds me of Hockney. Yeah. Yeah, it has kind of like that feeling too. And I'm reminded when I look at Carlene's work of Rothko, especially when you get to see yeah. like the first mm -hmm. piece, those layers. And just a P.S. I've been friends with Carlene for many years. We used to share a studio space together in New Smyrna Beach with another artist. And there's a looseness that's been happening in her work lately that I see. A really nice simplicity. But everything she produces is very masterful. And she whips it out. You know, she's coming to a studio for an hour or two, and she's whipping stuff like this out. It's, I, it's, I find that the, this protect this one, the the left half of the painting is more realistic with the clouds and the trees, mm -hmm. whereas the right half of the painting is more abstract. So it's a diversity between two different feelings pulling and pushing toward each other. Mm, so I like, like that about it. Realistic, mm -hmm. it's yeah, realistic it's on the left, but it's it, you know abstract to the right because of the division diagonally between the two. So it's well, like they, painting. I like, how about the phrase in the feeling of an in-between world, in between realities, in between something, it's not one or the other. Well, one sort of looks like forest and the other looks like desert in a way. A you look at Pat, am I supposed to say anything or just be quiet? Well, we'll give you a chance to, to say something <laughs> later. Let me just count up the number to. of words I've jotted down so far. I've jotted down, let's see, six, nine, plenty, 12, 15, 16, 16 words. Hey, Pat, can I interrupt just a second? Sure. Um, when we do this in the studio when when what pat is pulling this from deriving this critique method from the artist is usually not in the immediate first conversations because that artist would be in a different critique group um but later when we all come together and the group has had a chance to really sort of define a cohesive message for the artist the artist comes in and listens. It's not the artist's job to present their work in this kind of critique. It's the artist's job to listen to how the piece is reading at that moment and, and see if the what the artist is seeing in the work is, is what the group is seeing in the work. And if it is, then, you know, yay. <laughs> but if it's not, then the artist has a decision to make. Is that okay with her? If the group isn't seeing exactly what the artist uh, maybe had an intention around. Sometimes that's fine. But if it's something that's, you know, really out of sync with what the artist had in mind, then the artist has some work to do mm -hmm. to pull that painting into where she wanted it to be. So I just wanted to fill that in, Pat. Sorry to interrupt here. And I neglected to say it. And Thank I'm you. so sorry. I can't stay for the rest of this because I love to talk about Carlene and Elizabeth's work. <laughs> um, but I've got another appointment that I can't miss. And okay. uh, y'all have fun with this. And I look forward to seeing the recording if y'all release it. 
Okay. You be well, friend. Talk to you later. Bye, y'all. Bye. Fran, Bye. Fran, I had an opportunity to paint with Fran recently, and she made a comment during this retreat we were both in. And the one thing she said that I took my takeaway was um, try to, when you look at the work and you're critiquing it, try to think of what you would underline in a book if you were reading something and it was sinking in and it's something meaningful to you. You know, sometimes when you, you read something and you either dog ear the page, you fold it down or you jot down the words or you highlight it if it's your own book, not a library book. I do that often. And a friend has gotten me in the practice inadvertently of actually writing a short verse before I actually create the work that I make. And that's what I go for when I paint. So when I look at this, I'm, you know, those are, that's what we're doing here. We're creating things that we want to go back to and look at those words that we want to go back to and look at later, the, the highlighting stuff that we pull out. So I've got a bunch of um, words here, and th this is what I have. Impressionistic, layered, bold, fantastical landscapes, division of the canvas into different parts or planes, broken up and put together, gritty texture, brushy surfaces, four seasons, other planets, painterly and loose brush strokes, an optimistic road trip, expansive um, season, expansive, I can't read my own handwriting, handwriting <laughs> session, mysterious, push and pull between abstract and more realistic uh, worlds or landscapes, in between realities, a sunny day road trip. Another thing that I noticed before, when I looked at, at this piece particularly, I almost feel like time is passing by. This and, and the, the next one, the little piece. I almost feel like there's a passage of time. There's somebody mentioned movement. I see movement, but I see time, time going by with all that that implies. It can be melancholy. It can be happy. So from these words, we craft a statement. Um, and I can write this down and send it to you all later. But I mean, it would start out. And, and when you're writing an artist statement, you really should avoid using um, using the word I or personal pronouns. You, you should endeavor to take them out. So my statement would be, um, if Carlene were writing this about herself, um, There's a push and pull between abstract and more realistic worlds and in between realities in the work. Movement, the passage of time, mysterious expansive planes are created with loose painterly brush strokes. You might visit another planet, find yourself in four seasons at the same time as you move around brushy surfaces loaded up with gritty textures. The surfaces are divided into planes or parts. They, they are broken up and put back together for you into fantastical landscapes. Now, I've left out the words impressionistic, layered, and bold, but I can work those in with what I did. But you get the idea mm -hmm. of how you can create a statement with just what we cooked up. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Yeah, and I'll write it out for you so you can see it. But those are all the words that you guys cooked up looking at this. Now, I, I see a commonality in everything we had to say. We're all basically viewing this work a certain way. 
and there was no disagreement on how we're seeing this work. Carlene, how did it measure up against what you're trying to convey, number one, and perhaps your own artist statement? Now, I've, I don't want Carlene to give us her artist statement. I don't want to put her okay. on the spot. But thinking about the work that you've created here and you're showing to us, does it communicate what what you want your viewer to see? Um, it, it communicates my process very well, very well. Um, the Especially the pieces. Um, I look at paintings as a puzzle. I was speaking with someone the other day and you know, you're always talking about things that are more abstracted and how do you know they're finished? Um, I said, to me, it's, it's, they're like puzzles and they're, it's finished when I don't see an, any other piece that would fit. So um, the pieces, the breaking up the canvas, um, you know, hit right the nail on the head. Um, the division of seasons, that's something I think about the seasons. Um, the warm colors contrasting with cool colors. And I often, I often break up my canvas. I, I don't intentionally do it, but I see that I have warm colors on one side, cool colors on the other. Um, so those things, yes, definitely um, the looseness that I strive for. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else The um, yeah, definitely the layers. Many times I put the underpainting, the first one, especially you, someone mentioned that the color was coming through the, that um, kind of a cad red. Uh, that's because the whole canvas was covered with that red first um, so that it'll show through. And no, I think everyone was um, very close to what I intend when I'm painting. Okay. Do you, is it your intent to create fantastical landscapes? Well, it's more of a, um, I mean, my background is I, I live on the river and I hike and uh, go kayaking and things like that. So that's the, that's the inspiration I bring back. And so, but they're not a particular place. They're not from a photograph. So I think that that's true also, um, that they're, they're more imaginary um just putting the elements of a landscape together and not having it be a certain particular place okay so yeah does anybody have any questions okay i'll write this out in some sort of coherent fashion for everybody later is that okay with you carlene oh thank you yes that's that was, that was very interesting so I okay. think it's very successful, right? If uh, she's trying to convey what we saw, I think it's wonderful. I think You're so getting too. the message across. Yeah, worked out. <laughs> it worked out okay. Yeah, oh. no, it, it's very interesting and um, and very helpful to to hear. Okay, now that process. Think about this. That process probably took us about 20 minutes in total. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've agonized over writing a statement, looking at my work and trying to identify, you know, what it is I want to say about it. Like, wh why did I create that? We did it in 15 or 20 minutes. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And this is a pretty painless way to, to do it. In fact, it's fun. And what I recommend to people, if they're going to do this and you're, you, you're looking at a body of work and you need to create an artist statement for a show or for a submission, you know, you're entering a jury competition and they want a statement. I would sit down with a body of your work. You could do it yourself. But I have found that when I invite a few other people in, it's even better. And what it also does is tell me whether, as Fran mentioned before, I'm succeeding in communicating what I want my work to communicate to people, or whether there's more work for me to do, or whether I'm happily resigned with what somebody is saying, you know? So it's, it's a very good and useful tool. And when I say a body of work, I mean several pieces, three, three 
can do it, but sometimes you need to sit down with 10 or 15 pieces, not, not two or three. So any questions? Pat, as, as they say, two heads think better than one. That's why when you have more than one person working on this, it's much easier. You know, the, the words just come out and then you can it, come to a, a statement much, easy, much, much faster I and agree. with a different viewpoint. <laughs> I'm just going to check the chat a minute because I see a few comments. I want to make sure I'm not missing. Uh, okay. Okay, Patty. I, will, I have Patty's a question, Pat. Sure. Um, what is the case if you you create a piece of work that you didn't have an initial thinking, you didn't have a thought about it, you simply did the work without having, okay, I want this to be seen, I want that to be seen. It's just something that comes out of you. Yeah. And then you do a critique on it. Um, and, and there are words that, it, just enlighten you, the artist, about what what you're sending out. Is this a whole different ball of wax? That happens to me all the time, Judy. Um, <laughs> me but, too. Yeah, it happens all the time. I my work, for example, the painting that's in back of me on my, you know, my um, my screen. You would never know looking at that 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 painting is about a war song and but that's what it's about and it's titled in the meadow title kind of gives it away but it's part of the lyrics of a soldier's marching song a ukrainian soldier's marching song so i am i'm taking something that has this pretty sugary quality to it and making it something a, a little revolutionary, um, a little defiant, a lot defiant, if you know the war song, and something meaningful to me. And people are going to see different things when they look at that. And that's, that's fine. It'll communicate something pretty. But it, in the end, I know where that came from. And it's fine that people see something that's more decorative, um, you know, or, or colorful or, or even happy. Um, but the prompt is pretty guttural. So that's, you know, what, what prompted me to do it. The other thing I've been doing lately, and I'm just speaking for myself, I'm, I'm taking everything I'm finding in my storage bins and I'm systematically reworking it with the exception of a few things that I decide, you know, yeah, they deserve to live another, another day, but a lot of really interesting stuff happens when you start doing that and it communicates a whole new message. And somehow that history that was there before pops out. I use a lot of graffiti supplies in my work and graffiti supplies, especially graffiti inks, they don't disappear. You can't get rid of them. Um, you know, those street artists knew what the heck they were doing when they started mm -hmm. painting subway cars and, and buildings. You, it's a beast to get rid of some of those marks. So it's really interesting to, for me to see how the old work kind of bubbles up into the new stuff. In, in other words, no matter where you go in life, there you are. Your hint <laughs> is going to be in it. Um, it's how you explain your work to others. And you're, that really is important. You want people to approach your work um, and be able to appreciate it in concrete terms. They may not come away with the same sense of your work that you intended or wanted them to. And then as Fran said before, you need to decide whether that's acceptable for you, or whether you need to keep moving on to something else. Could I interject for a moment? And that's just to say, I get turned off by art, art speak in statements. And what you're saying is, how do how do we express this in more concrete terms for everybody to understand? That's right. 
because an art everybody who looks at your work isn't necessarily going to be Jerry Sauls. It's it's not going to be the art critic for you know Harriet Heitman, Naples Daily News, or Gulf Gulf Shore Business these days. It's not going to be somebody who's skilled in doing it. So you know it's you need to do it for others. Um, you need to do it for for people who are looking at your work. Plus it's, um, you know, using words that describe emotion or descriptive words. As she said, there's a, the art speak, but then there's also the, oh, it's pretty, or it's, you know, those general terms that don't really tell you anything deep about the piece. So this is a great exercise. That's mm -hmm. right. I mean, those are very nice general terms and it, they may actually, and they may be very true, but sure. you want to explain to people what motivated you to create that. It's or the what, why. What, yeah, and what made, say you could say it's pretty, but what makes it pretty? Why is it pretty, you know, and then go deeper, so. And I think even in the midst of it being a surprise, ad admitting that a piece came as a surprise is mm -hmm. pretty powerful too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Oh, Judy has a question. Judy, you're muted though. Thank you. Uh, another question. Do the words that you use in your statement or in the description, for whatever reason you're writing your piece, does it pigeonhole the viewer's vision so that they lose their own personal response to it? Hmm. That's a good question. Oh. I, I I don't see it that way. I'll give you an example. I my artist statement. I I had to create an artist statement for a show, um, and they blew it up and they put it on this big poster and they hung it up. And I I talk about how the written word really influences what I'm creating. You're not going to see letters words in my work, but I'm explaining to viewers how they conjure up a feeling or an image for me. And, and my reading is varied. My reading is, um, and lately I've taken to writing and I'm writing short verse. Working with Fran, she pointed out to me that my reading was very complicated. So I'd go from painting 12 or 14 hours in the studio you know, collapse at night after dinner with this, you know, home, this book that would, you know, be pretty weighty and then go to sleep. And she was like, you know, your brain's not shutting off. So she suggested I read short verse or haiku. And my first reaction was, ew, haiku. I hate haiku. I had to write that stuff in grammar school. I can't stand it. And, and everything I've ever read that's haiku just didn't appeal to me. So now what I've taken to doing is writing my own. And I play with that, you know, the, the five, seven, five formula. And I write something and I'm thinking about what my prompt is. And I'm creating in response to that prompt. So I'm kind of combining like the analytical with the creative side of my 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 personality. And I'm producing work like those collages on the postcard that you saw before for this Naples Botanical Garden show. That's collage. That's little bits of paper that make no sense to anybody. And I put them down on a 10 inch square surface and I somehow created some sort of alt reality, you know, alternate, alternate reality, alternate facts. And then I had to resolve the problem. And there's a verse associated with each one of them. This one is displaced. What occurred to me after Hurricane Ian, I mean, the animals were gone. And I, and, or I was finding them in a weird place. I live in a gated community, cookie cutter houses. I'm seeing panthers running across my front yard, you know, and, and hiding out in the woods adjacent to my property. Um, I have a pet woodpecker to this day. I have this woodpecker that keeps coming around every day and wants me to feed him. I mean, they've been displaced. People have been displaced. And that's what's prompting me. And I write about that. And then I created something in response to it. And so, so maybe, maybe 
what Good. you're saying to you. Okay. And I took the dryer and I put the other ones in the dryer. Okay, and you put the wash in the dryer? A little bit of wash. Oh, <laughs> something else going on. Okay, what were you saying, Carly? Maybe, maybe what you're saying about the statement, and I'm thinking to myself, is you're going to be creating a statement. Um, Someone needs to mute. Yeah, you're creating a statement that is more about your body of work and not a particular painting. So you're creating, um, you know, like she was asking, would that sway the viewer when they looked at your painting? Well, if it's if your statement is about your whole body of work, then I think that kind of covers, you know, takes care of that issue. And right. You're not talking about a, a particular painting. You're talking about that your whole series or body of work. Right. So the other thing that, that's, that's exactly correct. It's it's that roadmap you're giving viewers on how to approach your art before they walk into look at a body of your work. And it's different than a process statement. A process statement is I use, you know, glue. I cut up magazines. I use mm -hmm. glue, put them down on us, blah, blah, blah. That that's, that's talking about the process. That process is not important to how you read my work though. It's two different things. It's also not biographical. I mean, one time somebody told me, because it's in my bio, I put a short piece in there and, Car and Annabelle mentioned it. I, make, I used to make Ukrainian Easter eggs. Well, that has nothing to do with what I do now as an adult. I mean, I, I'm not creating Ukrainian Easter eggs. I'm not using, you know, those marks, traditional forms to create this stuff. The, the only correlation is that it's more mark making of a different kind. There's no encaustics involved in this. You know, this is all uh, water-based mixed media. So um, with the exception of the graffiti ink. So, you I'd know, like, can I it's make not biographical. Can I make a comment in regard to what Judy was, was uh, inquiring about? You know, there's the school of thought. Do you title your piece of art as untitled, or do you title your piece of art to lead the viewer to maybe perceive it in a certain manner? So I'm also of the opinion of being on one side or the other, depending upon the series that I'm painting. But what it would be interesting is, Judy, if you were thinking, how about you create a artist statement that that talks about how to view the work, but then the piece, each of the pieces are titled untitled. So, so it, it's one thing to have a specific way of viewing it when you have a title and whatnot, but this is kind of doing uh, both as an alternative, but I'm just throwing that out. There's, there's always been that debate. The abstract expressionists were of the 50s, um, and early 60s were really famous for for creating untitled work and right which is fine and they, their purpose was not to suggest to viewers what um they should be seeing in the work some people diverge you know they they separated from that practice um motherwell the the elegy paintings um you know the, just different things happened with time People like Pollock did the same thing too. Krasner started putting titles on everything too. So it depends. It depends. The title is going to be suggestive. When I go into a show, I don't look at titles. I look at the work. I try to take it in. I'll look for an artist statement before I come into a show, um, but I don't look at the title cards. I The only time I'm really focusing on the title cards is if I want to see either dimensions or medium. And... If I'm only left with the title, well, then that's what I have to get. You know, that's all I'm going to get. Um, can I interrupt, Pat? Can we continue with the critique, please? Can we sure. present the work of Elizabeth Williams so that we make sure, sure that our audience is still tuned before, you know, more time we, continues? Thank you. Absolutely. Now we're going to go to Elizabeth Williams, who's still here, I hope. Um, <laughs> and um, she's given us three pieces. 
Um, do we know the dimensions of this first piece? Hi, Pat. Um, this one is 60 inches by 60 inches. Okay. And by the way, I've painted with Elizabeth too. Just another person who cranks it out like <laughs> hotcakes. And this one is 18 by 36. And this one's 24 by 24. Everybody. Fun, 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 fun. I guess that's the first word. <laughs> I would say uh, childlike, doodling. Exuberant. Primary. Oh, colorful, colorful. I thought playful, but that goes with everything else. It's almost edible. <laughs> Yeah. So much texture, I want to lick it. I would That's say a good spontaneous. One. Spontaneous. Frosting. Spontaneous. Energetic. Yeah. Energetic. Energy. Happy. I I get the feeling of a circus or a carnival. Just a really joy-filled, thrilling experience mm -hmm. filled with raw. Joy. Yeah. And maybe even musical. Musical, yeah. yeah. They're festive. The texture is really rich, too. It's from the unconscious. Tactile. Yeah, tactile. I think, Helene, you mentioned colorful. What struck me here was there's a nice balance between light and dark and um, pastels and vivid colors. Mm. Yeah, there's a depth. Depth and creates an illusion of depth. I would say it's expressive and casual. It doesn't have the constrictions that we try to put on work. You know, they, the marks almost feel like they're expanding out, like they're floating out. They're coming out of the, and, and going wider and off the canvas. Sense of freedom. Fun. She's having fun doing it. Hypnotic. Mm -hmm. This one, if you stare at it long enough, it's gonna it's gonna mm -hmm. mesmerize you. <laughs> There's almost a language. Um, You don't see letters, but you see um, symbols, symbolic language kind of coming out. The lines and marks seem to create really interesting shapes, like whimsical shapes. That's a good one, whimsical. Anything else? Happy. The emotion is is uplifting. I don't know if I already said spontaneous. Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting balance of uh, pastel with strong color. Yeah, Elizabeth is is an amazing colorist. Yeah, that is for sure. Yeah. Unexpected petroglyphs. Hey, Petro that's good. Yeah, I was trying to think of something with the symbols that petroglyphs is great. Is all of her body of work this like this or is there something that is completely different? That would be interesting because I know we're creating a series of. Do you? So I would be very curious to know. 
You can see Elizabeth's work on Instagram. At, is Elizabeth, is it Elizabeth Williams Art? Yeah, yeah. This, and these, I was going to say, these three are um, pushing my work where I've been coming from. So this is um, a new series I'm experimenting with because it's so, I find it a little bit more radical than my other work. Um, and I thought, oh my God, is this okay? Like I actually doubted it for a bit. And, and the whole purpose of this body was to kind of let loose and just try to find the child within me, not make any judgments while I'm making the work and just have as much fun as possible. <laughs> and so you guys kind of, you kind of nailed all of the descriptive words and I've kind of developed a new formula for the paint. So I have this special mixture that allows me to get the dimension while still being fluid. And I can, I can kind of, I feel like I'm writing with it as I'm making the mark. So um, it's been a really um, fun process for me and I keep exploring, you know, different ways of doing it. So. Thank you for jumping ahead to that part. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, you did me a favor. Um, <laughs> but if you go to her Instagram page, you're going to see that at some point in time, Elizabeth even played with um, video. And oh, yeah. she, did, yeah. she did a series involving faces that morphed into different things. I mean, this woman's a mad genius. When I met her many <laughs> years ago at the Atlantic <laughs> Center for the Arts, she was doing these massive paintings and she had this array of like paper plates with all of these pots of paint on them that she had, you know, conjured up. And she was doing like these big abstract swirls. I mean, she did one piece, what was it like two stories high? I mean, it was just <laughs> enormous. It was like a banner. Yeah, and, it was like 12 feet or something. And, and when she went to bed at night and I was in the studio, I looked over and I took a photo of her workstation because it looked like an altar. It looked holy. It had that whole, you know, religious experience to me. It was well, just... it's that whole thing that you just described is really basically my starting point, my pro process. So to me, I premix all my colors ahead of the painting session and so and this body of work is the same way so all of these colors are pre-mixed and I have mm -hmm. a big table full of these buckets of paint or tubes of paint or bottles of paint and so it allows my process to just be intuitive in the way that I just pick up a color because my body says pick that color so that's just been my process since I've always painted. So I don't know how to paint mixing one color at a time. I would probably get very stuck. You're very organized. I, mean, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I remember oh, being yes, right you next, are. I was right next to Elizabeth at one of the workshops and we are total opposites. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you're very here. meticulous. <laughs> like you pick the right exact color that you need right there where right. I'm all experimental. Like, I don't know what yeah. that's going to be. Let me grab it and see you know, and then I make it work. <laughs> it's really cool. Okay. So <laughs> let's, let's try to figure, I, we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. We've got plenty here to work with. Ah, here's, here's how this is going to look. Joy filled, thrilling carnivals or musical theater, mu musical festivals appear on richly textured tactile surfaces. Paintings that are colorful and uh, colorful with a nice balance between lights and darks, I'll find another word for nice, and pastels and vivid colors create the illusion of depth and three-dimensionality. Marks seem like they're floating out or off the surface. The work is hypnotic, mesmerizing, and have a sense of freedom. Paintings seem to convey a language filled with whimsical shapes and unexpected petroglyphs. The work is simply fun. Is it childhood doodling, exuberant play? 
the viewer is left to decide. Something like that. What do you think, guys? You created this. Now, Elizabeth, now we're going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Thinking of your artist statement, how does it measure up against what you would have to say about your work? It sounds like we pretty much nailed it. Yeah, you did nail it. Or and, you nailed um, it. It's different <laughs> from my current artist statement because my um, the last body of work that I just finished, I'm not sure if I'm finished, but I'm right now at a pausing spot, is a combination of kind of wild graphics like this with very calm spaces and a geometric grid on top. And it was um, yes. a combination of structure and abstract marks that I wanted to try together. And I really, really loved the outcome of that. So my statement is it has been geared to that body of work. So like I said, this is new and it kind of leaves out the structure part. There's no space to get a relief, not too much space for relief, or there's no grid and there's no structure. It's basically a study of color, form, it's freedom, it's stress relief for me. <laughs> it's wonderful. I have to mention one thing, uh, another um, self-promo sort of thing, but for Elizabeth. Elizabeth has one more week to go on a solo show at the Center for the Arts of Bonita Springs. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, and it's beautiful work. And that grid-like work she's talking about is in that show. And it's well worth the trip and the visit. It's, it's really nice stuff. But you get to see her mastery of color in that work too. That seems to be a real common thread. And I, I know Elizabeth, I know a little bit about her bio. She spent many years as a graphic designer in a corporation. So, and to me, people who have that background, their work takes on a certain look. I mean, just the way you're able to throw things together is amazing to me. You just have this extraordinary talent for resolving things. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Yeah, no, it's true. Judy currently made a comment. She said she hopes that I bring this workshop back. Um, another time examining figurative representational work. Well, thank you. Okay, you're very welcome, Judy. She left apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we actually have done this exercise once before. I did it um, for the Massachusetts chapter and we were focused on an artist who did um, very realistic work and the other artist who was Jennifer Okamura. She does figures. She does the you figures. Know, but it's interesting to, it would be interesting to do it, but I don't think that you'd find it that much different even though the subject matter is different, the descriptive words, the emotions, um, the color, those things are all there, no matter what the subject matter is. So it's, that would be, it would be interesting. I agree with you. I, I find that, you know, you're drawn to certain things. So what draws you to a Hockney may very well draw you to, you know, an Elizabeth Williams right. or Carleen McConnell or a Denise... Mahoney, <laughs> who works with the figure also in her pieces. So th this is just another tool that you can use to be able to express what you want to people who come to see, excuse me, come to see your work. I just happen to have taken it in a different direction by using it to do something that I find personally very painful. And if anybody wants to sit down and, you know, have me look at a body of their work so that they can create an artist statement, I'm happy to do it with you. I, as I said before, to me, it's easier when you have two or three other people at least looking at the work. And that's the other thing. Select people selectively. You know, use people that you trust. Some people are going to be able to, um, you know, express themselves, A, honestly, but also not not get hung up on the technical terms, you know, like adding a certain medium to a paint that gives it texture. So, 
And that's what you want when you're you're writing one of these statements. So make sure it's somebody that you you know you trust, you know, you and sometimes that's not always, you know, your spouse or an artist friend, maybe somebody totally different. <clears throat> Any questions? This has no. been wonderful. I really appreciate the uh, artists that were chosen for this uh, because we put you on the spot. <laughs> and uh, we are glad that you agree with our results. Okay. And um, and Pat, I encourage you to keep uh, presenting this for us it, it, to the whole Nawa Florida, not just in private uh, as you're offering, but I think we all benefit from it and we certainly have a very good time along the way. So um, I would like to encourage all of you who have not yet given us a workshop, please contact me to text me is the best method. And uh, I can certainly give you a time. You can do the workshop, you know, guide us along, talk about your art, anything you want. And Pat, we welcome you to do this in a few months because it's delightful. It's really been very interesting. And I encourage each one of you to add uh, our information on Instagram, on the web. So we all check each other's work and follow each other. So um elizabeth i hadn't seen you on instagram and i just did and it's phenomenal because it's oh, really different to what you showed today yeah thank you so it's delightful i i enjoyed that so ladies it's been a pleasure and looking forward to our next uh presentation next month i i had it here to tell you but let me just mm -hmm. quickly look um so it's uh in july it's lolly owens uh july 19th and she'll be talking about painting from the inside out, a journey of meditation and self-expression. So we're looking mm -hmm. forward to our upcoming workshops. Thank you so much for tuning in and for your time. And Pat, thanks once again. You've done several of these for us, and we are extremely grateful. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Annabelle. And thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Pat. Thank this you. All wonderful. soon. And thank, thank you, everyone. You. Okay, and I'll email everybody that statement. We're all sending it to Denise and she can circulate, but I think I've got everybody's address. And kindly add the information of where you're donating the proceeds of your exhibit. Yes. And if you can add the, the Instagram of a, our featured artist today so that everybody can follow them. Thank okay. you so much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.